Thank you everybody for coming. First of all, this talk is not going to be just my research, it's going to be the research of my team going back many years and it's going to be the research of colleagues all the way around the world as well and I think there's some interesting little stories there which I hope you can take home but the main point I want you to take home from this talk is about when I mention the word pollution, I want you to remember the pollution that you can't see not the pollution that you can see. Because sometimes it's the pollution that you can't see is having those adverse effects on our environment. So I, I imagine if I just threw out that word pollution and, and that you kind of thought in your mind, what, what, what would it be? There would be various different things, and it could be oil pollution. It could be plastic pollution. It could be sort of dead fish that might, might conjure up. So we're, we're interested in the things that are so small, they're dissolved in the water, you can't see them, but they can still have quite dramatic effects. So we've done a little animation um, to sort of explain what we're going to be talking about. We're going to be talking about pharmaceuticals, but we're also going to be talking about legacy pollutants, ones which we've banned 30-odd years ago, but they're still impacting wildlife today. <laughs> Most people aren't aware that the active ingredients in the medications we take live on long after we've swallowed the tablet. Martin's been prescribed an antidepressant, which he finds helpful for his depression and anxiety. His neighbor Maureen takes an oral contraceptive pill, hay fever treatment in the summer, and painkillers for her bad back. And just next door, Julie's recently been found to have high cholesterol, so she's been started on a statin. Unbeknown to most of us, intact remnants of many of these drugs can be found in our urine and feces. Sewage from our toilets is processed at sewage treatment plants, but these were simply not designed to cope with pharmaceutical and recreational drugs, and so they end up in our rivers and estuaries. Here, unsuspecting marine animals ingest the drug and hormonal remnants. Thanks to advances in technology, it's now possible to look at the effects this has on our sea life. And we've discovered marked changes in the character and behaviour of many aquatic organisms. In some cases, the animals even change sex in response to the hormonal pollutants. And as these are quite biologically active compounds, they don't need to be present in high concentrations to have these effects on the wildlife that swim in and drink the water. So hopefully the fact that I've got two toilets on the front of the stage now becomes a little bit more clearer. And whilst I remember, thank you to the members of the design engineering team at the University of Portsmouth for when I said, please, can I have a toilet? And can I have a toilet cut in half as well? Which turned out to be not the easiest job in the world. <laughs> so you may have seen this on the news just literally last week. Overprescribing of medicines must stop, says government. And I was quite intrigued watching this, that 6.5% of hospital admissions are due to adverse effects of medicines. So if you didn't already know that Medicines and little tablets contain very powerful biological substances, and they can have adverse effects on us. They also do us a lot of good as well and protect us. 15% of people take five or more tablets a day. So we all take tablets, and they all come out of us. They all go down our toilet, and they all end up in our sewage treatment works. And if our sewage treatment works are working properly, they can treat them to a certain extent and remove some of those compounds, but a lot of them go through. They were never designed to get rid of them. Sometimes, and unfortunately a little too often at the moment, they don't go through the sewage treatment works and they go through stormwater overflows and go straight out into the ocean, as you probably heard on the news recently. But before I go on to the pharmaceuticals, I want to take a step back into a subject which kind of started to come about in the 1990s, and it was the fact that a huge range of chemicals can act just like hormones or interfere with our endocrine system and the production of hormones or the breakdown of hormones. And we called these chemicals 
endocrine disrupting chemicals because they disrupt our endocrine system. So here, this is poor Lulu. Lulu washed up on the shores of Scotland almost five years ago exactly. And when they did some biopsy samples of Lulu, she turned out to be one of the most biologically contaminated organisms ever researched. And this was because she was full of PCBs. PCBs were these chemicals that we had in our electrical components, uh, but they were subsequently banned uh, many decades ago, 30, 30 years ago. But they're still finding their way and building their way up through the food chain. What was interesting and tragic about Lulu, that she was thought to be somewhere between 20 and 30, uh, the necropsy um, showed that she'd never had a calf. She came from uh, the UK's only resident killer whale population. There's only eight. They'd studied them for over 20 years. That whole population has, has never had a calf. This is some research that's come out this year. And some killer whales are seal eaters, and others down the bottom there are fish eaters. What they've discovered is that the seal eaters accumulate a lot more PCBs in their bodies than the fish eaters. And the other thing that you might be able to get from this graph, and my laser pointer isn't working too great, this side of the graph is the, the levels in a male. This side is the levels in a female. You can see the, the, the fish eaters, it's a lot lower. Sorry if you can't see that so well in the back. But these lines that you've got going across the graph here, these are ri risk thresholds. If it gets above these lines, then it's been determined that there is an adverse effect on the health of those killer whales. It could be, they're immunocompromised. There could be reproductive effects on them. So you can see that the males are getting a lot more PCBs in their bodies than the females. That's tragic because this poor killer whale, that was just a young one, washed up on the shores of Norway last year. It was still suckling milk from its mother. The reason that the females have got less is because they offload their contaminants on their young. That killer whale died of the contaminants that were going through the milk uh, when they did the necropsy. These PCBs, some of you may know that turtle eggs, if you incubate them in warm sand, you get females. If you incubate them in cold sand, you get, you get males. If you incubate them in cold sand, which should create males, but put PCB chemicals over the surface of the eggs, it changes them to females. Those chemicals can override that environmental sex determinating process. And these chemicals that are endocrine disruptors are in all our household products. They're in our um, personal care products. They're in our cleaning products. We've heard a lot about plastic, and plastic is obviously one of those, those um, pollutants you can see but these plastics contain over 10,000 different chemicals. Over 2,000 of those chemicals are known to have reproductive, neurological, immunological, cancer-forming agents in them. So they can leach out into our environment. And obviously, some of the pharmaceuticals as well, which we discussed earlier. So on my birthday, on the 19th of May, 2019, the 150th millionth chemical was registered by the American Chemical Society. There is a new chemical created and registered every 2.5 minutes. We produce lots of these, and they don't go through that much rigorous chemical testing for their environmental impact before they go into our everyday products and ultimately could end up in our environment. Many of the ones that were discovered before the more advanced regulation came in are already in products and never got tested. This is a marine talk, yeah? Why am I talking about a Florida panther? Well, there was a study in Florida that suggested not a single panther's testes had descended correctly. Now, this non-descended testes is increasing at an alarming rate in our children. And in this case, it was associated with pesticides and some PCB contamination as well. Sticking in Florida, this is Lake Apotka, and it's a beautiful
photograph, and there's a beautiful, beautiful lake as well. And that is a younger version of me there 20 years ago on the end of a pontoon looking down. And I was looking for some alligators because the studies there at the time were suggesting that a pesticide spill that had gone into Lake Apotka had caused lots of reproductive abnormalities in the, in the alligators. The press had a field day because the alligators' penises were so small that they couldn't reproduce. Even the, the, the hatchling rate of the babies um, was very low, and when they measured uh, the hormones in those baby alligators, there was abnormal levels of testosterone and estrogen. And it was because this pesticide, DDT, was an endocrine-disrupting chemical, and it acted like estrogen. Reports started coming up of intersex polar bears being discovered in the Arctic. And this is a study that we've been doing around Portsmouth. You might recognize these little snails on the rocky shore. These completely disappeared around this area not too long ago because of the anti-foulants that we used to put on the underside of our boats to prevent things fouling them. It turns out that these anti-foulants containing tributyl tin would make a female snail grow a penis. So this is a male. That bit there where you can see the red dot is its penis. This is a female. This is a female that's growing a penis here, and it's called imposex, where the imposition of the male organs are on the female. They disappeared, but they've now just come back, but many of my project students have been working on these, and about 50% of the snails that you get around here, the female snails, have got a penis. It rose slightly after we redredged the harbours just outside here to let those big aircraft carriers get back in here. So those, we banned these tributyl tins a long, long time ago, but they're still there in our sediments. There was a lot of studies that were done in the UK and around the world where people downstream of sewage treatment plants were finding intersex fish. And this is a rud here. This is testicular tissue, and in the middle of that photograph, this is ovarian tissue inside the testes. This male fish... Is, is changing sex, it's being feminized. And it wasn't just in the freshwater environment as well. This is a flounder, and in the more industrial estuaries of the UK, you would find flounder, and if you dissected out its testes, you would find ovarian tissue growing in that. And this was because of all the chemicals that are going in, which are either natural estrogens, synthetic estrogens, or chemicals that which acted like estrogens. Scientists did studies to prove it was the, the wastewater coming out of sewage treatment plants, and they would cage fish just downstream and compare it to fish that were caged upstream of sewage treatment plants. And what would happen, the male fish would produce a yolk protein that should have only been produced by female fish. So it's a very good marker. You could show if a fish was being feminized if a male fish started producing these yolk proteins. People want to know what was the long-term impact. Yes, you've got lots of fish changing sex downstream of a sewage treatment plant, but what, what does it mean in terms of the population? Now, scientists in Canada um, were able to do a whole lake experiment. This is Lake 260. And they were able to take the contraceptive pill, add it to the lake at the concentration that you would find it downstream of a sewage treatment plant. This is Lake 260 here. They had lots of experimental lakes, and this is this little boat trying to mix up lots of contraceptive pill in this massive lake and try and get it to that concentration. What happened is that the fish population collapsed within three years. They did histological sections. The testes were turning into ovaries. And I know that this graph is really difficult to read at the back, but essentially the top one is the female, they're measuring yolk protein in the top in females, and on the bottom they were measuring it in males. The first bars, and I'm going to walk over here and the cameraman's probably going to go, oh. This is a control lake, this is a control lake, the black bars were the lake where they added the contraceptive pill. What you'll notice down the bottom with the males, there are incredibly low levels of this yolk protein. Males still produce it, but the levels are around one or two. In the lake where they added the contraceptive pill, it goes up to 10,000, 12,000. They had to change the scale bar on their, on their graph just so they could fit the data in there. 
Those fish that produce that amount of protein, they can't deal with it. Their liver can't cope with it. They end up dying. They started measuring this protein in our cod in the North Sea as well. They started showing that cod in the North Sea were producing this protein. And even studies in swordfish in the Mediterranean where the male fish had this protein in as well. This is the critter that I usually work with, and it's a, a little amphipod. It's a small little crustacean around about a centimetre to a centimetre and a half. And these are fascinating creatures because they contain all these weird and wonderful parasites. This little animal, called a Kynogamorous marinus, it doesn't have a really cool common name, unfortunately, has parasites that can change its sex. And we've discovered new species as well inside it that can do that. And it does that because being in a male is a dead end. So it can only pass on the parasite through its eggs. So it somehow circumvents the sex determination process, so it turns into a female and then produces eggs. Sometimes, and in polluted conditions, it doesn't change their sex so well, and it leaves them half male and half female. But there was another parasite that I was really interested in this animal, and it lives in the brain here. It can raise the serotonin levels in the brains of the shrimp to the point where it makes them more attracted to light, and it does that because it wants its host to be eaten. And I thought, hold on a minute, there's a lot of people taking antidepressants in fact, there's the same number of people taking antidepressants that take the contraceptive pill. What happens if the parasite raises serotonin levels that controls the behavior? What happens? Can Prozac do the same things? So we did some quite simple experiments, which were literally a plastic tube with black tape on one side. You put the little shrimp in, and if it's parasitized, it would spend more time on the light side. And you can score how much time it spends on that side. Or if it's not parasitized, it spends more time on that side. And you can put it in a long beaker, and the parasitized ones would spend more time at the top of the beaker, and the unparasitized ones would spend more time on the bottom of the beaker. We did this exposing these animals to the antidepressants that we take that comes out through our wee and our feces and goes down our toilets. And, um, yeah, the press had a field day. Prawns on Prozac. It, it did very, very similar things. And um, we got slightly more high-tech after just doing plastic tubes, and we bought image analysis equipment and video tracking software. Uh, this is quite interesting. This shrimp, at the moment, it's in the dark. The light's gone on. It's not going to like it on the light side, so it's going to go a little bit crazy, and we can measure its behavior and how long it spends on the light side versus the dark side, the reaction speeds. And uh, I think it's going to creep over there again, realize the light's on and not going to want to go back there. Oh, uh, yep, he's out. And... <laughs> And then the light's going to go off, and it's going to carry on going all the way around. There you go, the light's off. And then it's happy to venture back over to the light side and do its usual spinning around there. So this is new scientists making fun of our research in, in 2010. Prawns on Prozac, whatever next. Crabs on cocaine. Well, funny enough. <laughs> <laughs> and, and this wasn't our work. This was um, some, some friends of mine in, in another university where, where they found these little shrimp are, are full of cocaine all over the, uh, sort of the Suffolk, Suffolk rivers. And this was a, um, this was a, a headline from, from the BBC News just last week, I think it was, at Glastonbury. There was so many people taking MDMA and, and cocaine in Glastonbury that they could detect it four times more in the river a week later because it had found its way through after they're doing wheeze in the fields through the soil and through the surface runoff in, into the nearest river. We have done some work on cocaine on shrimp, and that's what they look like. Um, we didn't actually find very many effects it had on them, but we've still got to look into the data a little bit more. But that's, that's one of our studies where we expose them to cocaine at the concentrations that you might find in, in, a, in a river. This is a fascinating story. What, what you've got here is a cuttlefish that has been exposed to antidepressants. And you have control ones. And the control ones, and you're probably aware that cuttlefish and octopus and things are quite intelligent creatures. They will learn quite quickly that they can't get at that shrimp in this glass tube. And then they will go away. The ones that are on the antidepressants keep going. They keep going at it and they don't learn as quickly that it's too hard to get. You then take the cuttlefish away for a couple of weeks and then you reintroduce them to the experiment. 
the control animals remembered going, yeah, that was too difficult, I'm not going to bother. Whereas the ones which were exposed to the antidepressants went straight back at it again and went, oh, I want to get the trip kind of thing. So um, fascinating. And these are concentrations that you find downstream of sewage treatment plants. And that's once, that's the treated sewage, not the untreated sewage. This is quite a sad story, but it's a very nice slide in the sense, uh, as a study that came out of Australia um, in the last couple of years, where they were finding lots of antidepressants in the rivers, and they started measuring it in the invertebrates in the, in the river, and they worked out the concentration that, the, that it was going to in the invertebrates, and then they worked out how many of these invertebrates would a, a duckbill platypus eat. And from that, they worked out a duckbill platypus was getting about a 60% human equivalent dose of antidepressants per day through its food. They don't know what the effects of antidepressants are on duckbill platypuses. Right, a little bit closer to home now. Hopefully you recognise Portsmouth. We're somewhere, I think, around here, aren't we? All these blue bits on this map of Portsmouth and Gosport and Hailing are historic landfills. Now, there's a lot of landfills in this area, and there's a lot of things that went into those landfills that we don't know what's in there, because they were built before a time that the legislation meant that we had to know what went in there, and they were built before a time in which they were probably made to stop things leaking out of there as well. Um, the bottom figure here is, is the kind of predicted sea level rises for the end of the century, and these are some of the conservative ones. Um, I'm going to show you a video in a minute, but where this video is taken is just here next to this landfill, just up, up here. And this was taken last year during one of the lockdowns, and, um, and it was a high tide. It breached the, the seawall there and completely flooded the fields. Now, I was talking about the PCBs earlier on in those killer whales. Two-thirds of all the PCBs made are thought to be still locked away in landfills around the world. So there are over 10,000 landfills maybe in the UK that could be at future risk from sea level rises. And unfortunately, we have quite a lot of them in this area. So there could be a second wave coming for those poor whales and dolphins off our shoreline. And this is another familiar picture that you may have seen recently, and there's been a lot of um, news on this, is stormwater overflows. So this is the Southern Water Beach Boy, and then every red square is that the stormwaters have gone off in the, in the last 24 hours. So last week, yeah, it pretty much lit up red, where unfortunately the systems can't cope with the rainfall, and um, a lot of the sewage was actually coming out along our coastline. Um, this is a sort of scaled up view. You've got the Isle of Wight, and you've got Portsmouth and Gosport here. This is a, a, a model, a tidal model of a, of a sewage spill coming out of Chichester Harbour. And don't worry too much about the severity of that spill. But what I wanted to emphasize is the fact that when you do have a spill, and there will be lots of other stormwater overflows within Chichester Harbour as well, and Langston Harbour, the others that it kind of washes back and forth, and it's got all the remnants of those active compounds that go down our loo. So very often we, we think of the fecal matter, and we sometimes forget that there's loads of untreated chemicals in there as well. We've done some sperm counts on these little amphipods, and remember, they are about only a centimeter big, so getting people, asking people to do a sperm count, one of these is quite tricky. It takes a little bit of training, <laughs> But you can dissect out its testes, and you can actually do a sperm count underneath a microscope. And they're incredibly low. Langston Harbour, just along here, the sperm counts are the lowest I've recorded anywhere in the UK. And I've done some previous papers where we've gone some, to some really polluted sites and clean sites and compared. And it turned out quite nice. The polluted sites had low sperm counts. The clean sites had high sperm counts. Portsmouth, we checked 10 years ago, and they were lower. And I actually thought we got it wrong. So over the years, we kept checking and checking and checking, consistently really low. And we don't know why. But we do know that the animals there are not that numerous. You get about six times less per square meter than you would do in some, <coughs> some clean sites. And these are important animals. These are the food for the fish and, and the birds. I said I'd mention a little bit about humans as well. A child born today will, on average, have half the sperm of their grandfather. 
So these pollutants that I'm talking about in wildlife are potentially affecting us as well. So this is a book that came out just a couple of months ago called Countdown, and it's the countdown to where scientists feel that the sperm counts are declining so much, sooner or later we may have, be having major fertility problems in the human race. So this is 1973. This is uh, 2007, I think, that this was. There was this 52.4% decline. And this is happening in lots of countries around the world. And this isn't just one study. This is the accumulation of hundreds of studies where they've tried to tease out the effects of alcohol, activity, obesity, and various socioeconomic factors, and they still get this rapid decline. This is sperm count in uh, millions per milliliter. Once it gets below 40, that's when they know that men tend to have problems um, conceiving or the, the, having children with conceiving. And the, um, we're, we're around about there at the moment, and it's not looking good. But one of the other interesting things about this study is there's lots of things that correlate with it. And one of them relates to this. So those of you who ever kept rats or mice, if you want to tell whether it's a boy or a girl, you kind of hold it up by its tail. And if there's a big gap between its bottom and its genitals, it's a male. And if there's a small gap, it's a female. If you expose these rats and mice to some of the chemicals that you get, these plasticizers, these things that are added to our plastics, that distance becomes smaller in the young. Those rats or mice more likely have a chance of non-descending testes like in those panthers and is increasing in humans. They have lower sperm counts. So people now measure the anogenital distance, which is this here. They've gone to humans and they've measured the same thing in humans and the people that have the smaller distance have the lower sperm counts. What was really intriguing is that they followed a cohort. They measured the children when they were born, and they followed them right the way through up until their teenage years. And the ones which had the low sperm counts had the low anogenital distance. But not only that, they'd kept the urine samples from the pregnant mothers. And the ones which had the small sperm counts, the low anogenital distance, also had the higher levels of plastic chemicals in the urine during the pregnancy period of the mother. Last year, a study came out suggesting that the testy size of the porpoises off the coast here are smaller in relation to some industrial chemicals like PCBs. Um, so this was done with the Zoological Society of London, and we're starting a really exciting project with them now where we're measuring the anogenital distance on a back catalogue of 20 years worth of washed up and necropsied porpoises. I'm just going to, I'm just going to flip over to a world clock. So I'm just going to finish on on this because I, I think this really kind of shows what our problem is here. At the turn of the 19th century, uh, the 1900s, we had about I think it's about two billion people. But this is the world population now, uh, 7.8 billion people. And that's you seeing it come up in real time. So those are people being born there right in front of your eyes. And you can see that the births today are a lot higher than the deaths today. So we need to be able to feed all those mouths. So I'll finish on this note that we are, if I go back to the, oh, I'm just going to, we are growing, aging, an increasingly medicated population that is dependent on clean water in a changing climate. And on that note, I'll finish and say thank you very much for listening and thank you for the people that have funded our research over the years. May we invite you to ask any questions to um, Professor Ford? You've told us what the problem is. Can you tell us how we, how we can deal with the problem? Great, great question. And, <laughs> and, I, um, and I really wanted to include that in the talk, but I had so many slides. Um, so one of the things that we can do, a lot of us do that we shouldn't do, is when we, with our waste pills, we kind of throw them down the toilet or we put them in, in the bin. 
Um, whereas in this country, we can actually take them back to the pharmacy and they'll get rid of them for free for us. In many countries, um, you, you have to charge to actually take them back and dispose of them. But the uptake of people doing that is actually greater than it is here when we don't have to pay for it. Um, so anybody can take their waste medication back to a pharmacy and they'll dispose of them appropriately. Unfortunately, we don't. We leave them in a drawer, kitchen drawers for ages probably, and then wait until they go out of date and then sort of throw them away. So that's one thing. The, obviously, the other thing that we could do is um, invest in our sewage treatment processes, but that's expensive. So it could be 30 billion to upgrade the entire um, sewage treatment network across the UK. The stormwater overflows that we touched on, it's been estimated that if we wanted to get rid of the combined um, surface and, and sewers, it could be 200 billion. Um, so it doesn't come, come cheap for these, and there are some countries that are saying, no, that's worth it. We want our rivers and our drinking water to be of a very high standard and, and, uh, and our wildlife to thrive because they provide a service to us as well. Can you give us a sense of the extent to which regulations are internationally negotiated for preventing some of these chemicals going into the water, or is it all subject to national jurisdiction? Um, well, I, I guess you, you, we have had various different international um, treaties that have gone in place. OSPA, for instance, was involved in sort of banning um, PCBs, for instance, and that worked quite well. Um, but we just didn't know that they would have this huge legacy, and they're still causing problems, even though they, they, are, they are banned. Um, so there are things that are done on a national level. In the same way that we have a, uh, an IPCC, International Council for Climate Change, uh, they think there should be one for chemical regulation as well, um, because there's lots of people doing things at different rates around the world. We're very good at retrospectively finding out that chemicals are bad. We're not very good at finding out before they go into our everyday products and then cause harm, because it takes a lot of evidence building to retrospectively go back and go, we shouldn't have that. The problem that we have in the industry at the moment, what, what's, what's hoping we'll go through in European legislation, and we don't know how it will work with Brexit here, is that very often the industry would just replace one chemical with another chemical that's just as bad, and then the scientists would have to take a long time proving that one's just as bad. So we've all got, well, I've got an aluminium one today, but every, if anyone's got plastic bottles, a lot of them say BPA-free on them now, because it was found out that bisphenol A was estrogenic. Uh, very often they've just um, replaced that with another bisphenol compound, which is also estrogenic, but it hasn't been banned yet. Um, so they, they want to, ban families of chemicals rather than just the individual substitution each time. Um, <clears throat> so you mentioned that um, there are potentially quite a lot of legacy pollutants locked away in landfill sites. Um, have you, or do you know of any um, actionable things we can do to start removing those pollutants for good um, or preventing them from reaching our waters? Um, well, I guess these legacy ones are, are a big problem because there's just thousands and thousands of them. We will have to deal with them, though, because as the sea levels are rising, we have a choice to make. We can either build up the walls around them so they don't get flooded and flush everything back up, or we have to do a managed retreat. If we do a managed retreat, then we have to somehow excavate them and put them somewhere else, which won't come cheap. But neither is building walls around them. Um, so at the moment, it's a grey area, whereas if it's the local council's problem or whether there needs, needs to be a national task force that comes up with the money because councils will not be able to afford it on their own. So in, in the US, they would come up with like a super fund or something like that, which, which would, would do that. But at the moment, it's not on the radar nationally here. Um, you're talking about how some chemicals are like sex, determ like determines the sex of certain organisms. And you were saying that how our water treatment facilities aren't good enough to filter out these pharmaceutical company, um, chemicals. I was wondering whether these chemicals actually has an effect on human um, sex determination or in um, mammals. They're certainly not sex determination, but there are, there are lots of increases in sexual abnormalities. If you look at that anogenital distance, um, that they've come, that there are loads of other things associated with that, like non-descended testes. Um, 
so they're on the increase, uh, but not necessarily in terms of sex determination, no. And, I, and, and that's, a, that's a tricky area where you kind of cross the barriers of what sort of um, social constructs of, of gender, gender identity, sexual identity, and sex determination as well. So it's, it's very much a grey area. Uh, I was just looking today at the stormwater overflows for the harbour. This year, 100,000 minutes, which is about 70-odd days. And I just wondered, given that the harbours are areas of, areas of outstanding natural beauty, SSSI, Ramsar, what your assessment of them overall is? Are they chronic? Are they OK? Are they poor? Are they good? Uh, well, I guess we know from Chichester Harbour that Natural England think that they are degraded and deteriorating. Um, I don't think that same assessment's been done of Langston Harbour, but I suspect it's in the same state. Um, we don't know whether those organisms are the flounders that we have in Langston Harbour or changing sex, but I would probably put some money on the fact that there are effects of those stormwater overflows around our harbours on the wildlife. I'm certain of that. I know if we went and collected animals from the harbours and measured them, they would be full of all sorts of chemicals. We don't know what effects it's having long-term on our seal population. But I would, if I was going to make predictions, I'd say yes, they are having an effect. If I was going to make predictions of all our paddleboarders and sailors and wild swimmers around here, I would say they're more likely to have um, antibacterial-resistant bacteria in their bodies than people that don't use the water as well. I just wondered if there are any sewage plants anywhere in the world that have been built that remove all the pharmaceuticals. Um, I'm not an expert on this from a chemical engineering perspective, but there are certainly ones that do better jobs at removing a lot more. And uh, the study which I showed where they put the contraceptive pill in a lake in Canada, they also showed the upstream and downstream of a sewage treatment plant that they upgraded to a very high spec. And what happened is once they upgraded it, there was no more um, intersex fish downstream and the diversity of all the marine, the river life increased downstream as a result of it. So we know if you invest that money, there will be a knock-on effect. So, so it is possible? It is possible, but yeah, as I say, it's expensive, yeah. Oh.